All right, my name is Heather Gray and the program is Just Peace. Before I go any further though, I want you to know that the opinions expressed on Just Peace do not necessarily reflect those of Radio Free Georgia Broadcasting Foundation or its board, staff, or volunteers. And I am here in the studio with co-producer Ernest Dunkley. Welcome, Ernest. Hi, Heather. Great. And I want you to know that we are going to be talking with Chad Russell tonight, who's also here in the studio. Good evening, Chad. <laughs> Good evening, Heather. <laughs> so it's just such a treat to have you here in the studio with us this evening. I just want you all to know that Chad was a good friend with Jamil el who was an imam here in Atlanta for some time and was just so incredibly influential. His brother, Ed Brown, used to serve on the board of directors here at WRFG and was a good friend of mine as well. So it's just thrilled to have you here in the studio, Chad. Again, I just wanted to tell you that. We're going to be talking about Thank Jamil you. tonight and about um, Chad's experience with him. But before we do that, though, Chad, tell us about yourself. Where are you? You're from Alabama. You're originally from Alabama, right? That's right. Yeah. Where in Alabama? Ellick City, Alabama is where I was born. I was, grew up a little bit in Camp Hill, Alabama. That's right between Tuskegee and Auburn University. Okay. And later in my life, uh, moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, you did? Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. actually. Okay. Mm. But tell us, your, your hometown again is in Alabama? Camp Hill, okay. Alabama. So, see, most of us here in Georgia, okay, we know, like, Montgomery, Birmingham, Selma. Where is that town in relation to those cities? It's a, Camp Hill is 36 miles from Montgomery. Um, actually, it's, it's... South or north? It's uh, south. South, okay. Yes. And uh, Camp Hill actually sits in the back door of Auburn University and Tuskegee University. Oh, it does. Yes. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm, uh, Tuskegee and Auburn is off 49, and Camp Hill is off 50. Okay. Hi Highway 50, that is. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when did you come to Atlanta? Came to Atlanta in 1964. Wow. Yeah. And grew up um, in the Summer Hill area. Played ball at uh, Price High School, Luther B. Johnson Price High School, and later transferred from Price High to Smith High School with uh, one of my most outstanding friends and coaches, Frank Glover. Oh, okay. Yeah, was a legendary coach in Atlanta and um, grew up and graduated from uh, Smith High School and went on to pursue my education at a what was once Atlanta Junior College, which is now Atlanta Metro College. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And I left from there and went and played basketball at Xavier University in New Orleans. And uh, but bef I, I knew Imam Jamil before I left and went to uh, New Orleans. Uh, he was. And uh, you knew him as the H. Rap Brown, right? I knew at him the time. as H. Rap Brown. <laughs> right. And. Um, Right. Very, very, very fun, nice guy, you yeah. know, very mannable, respectful person. And um, when I left to go and play ball in New Orleans, he would make sure that no one forgot about me in Atlanta. He would send everybody and tell everybody they had to come and see me play over there. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Oh, so it goes way back there. That's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so. And just, you know, I moved from Summer Hill and... Um, Probably in 1969, of course, then uh, the West End area was still pretty much lily white. There, yeah. were, there wasn't a lot of black people in the West yeah. End. And even so much so when the uh, Muslim community started moving in, I was already there on the corner of Oak Street and uh, West End Place. When, when, did, when did the Muslim community start moving in? Uh, when you're, we're talking about moving into the West End, right? Yes. Is that what you're talking yes. about? Yeah. It was um, roughly... Um, I, I don't want to quote the, the wrong year, so I won't say exactly, but um, it was um, roughly right around early, the late, early 70s, er, I mean early 80s was uh, when the community came in there. Early 80s, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Now, Ernest, you look like you're wanting to add to this or add a, ask a question or something. No, not as yet, not as yet, <laughs> not as yet, not as yet. All right. I will very shortly. No, though, I'm sure you will. I'm sure. As soon as you <laughs> move on to... to uh, I'm sure you will. So I didn't know about that long... So you'd known him for a long time and certainly would have known of his work in the South, like in Alabama and elsewhere, right? Of course, that was, you know, in the... 
in the early to mid 60s go go ahead you were gonna yeah he um i, I knew a lot about uh just um from having experience of knowing imam jamil and seeing him the work that he did how he came in and helped to establish the community in the west end and uh, knew of his work before i met him in the west end during the time that there was um uh, you know, there was a lot of killings in Selma Hill, and uh, matter of fact, the uh, wait killings. Are you talking about racially based? Yeah, the racially police police was killing police killing brutality. Black folks. Matter of fact, this young man stayed on Terry Street. The police had shot him on his back porch. Wow! And um, we had a riot. Yeah. Of course, you know there was a, a lot of people fighting and going on. So they called a, the authorities called H. R. Brown in. Then he wasn't Imam Jamil. They called him in to stop the riot. Wait, repeat that again. I'm sorry. They called the the authorities called H. Rap Brown to, to come, come in, in and stop the riot. To try to ease the tension from the riot. Oh wow! And, and did he? Well, he tried, but yeah. we, we shook him off the car. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah, we shook him mm -hmm. off the car, but I got to know him a lot better once everything. What do you mean was, you shook him off the car? Well, he was on top of the car speaking with a <laughs> microphone, and we was shaking the car, getting him off it. Why? Well, because at that point, you know, we had had enough because there was so much brutality going on, like I said, you know, in, in the Summer Hill area and throughout throughout the city of Atlanta where the police were st constantly shooting people for no, no reason, you know. Insane. And at the same yeah. time, we was having the oppression in the community with the Ku Klux Klan because they used to be right there in Grand Park before they went yeah, over to Stone right. Mountain. Yeah. And uh, it was just uh, an everyday thing in the ghetto, you know, suffering the oppression of uh, police brutality. Let, let me ask you this, Chad. Were you, did you notice a, a difference, say, in Alabama when, and, and Atlanta as far as racial oppression was concerned? Was there any difference? Well, I think... Not really. Yeah. Okay. You know, I you know I remember my grandmother. You know, on the times that she would have to go downtown, she would often tell me, "When we go to these people's store, don't take your eyes off of me. Yeah. And don't touch nothing in this store. Right. For the simple reason is that, in southern Alabama, rural Alabama, they was taking black folks' kids from their parents. And sometimes they would brutally beat them. Sometimes they would kill them. Wow. You see, so that was a warning that you had to be very cautious at all times. And it had a lot to do with your rearing and your growing up the way that you was raised, you see. I see. And that's what, um, so the, the, the um, you know, just seeing that the, the, it's not a whole lot different in Alabama and in the state of Georgia, even so much so that um it has the same, some of the same treatments. Yeah. You know. Right. You know, there was times when you couldn't just not walk through the West End. You know, West End was a very violent place. You know. And well, I'm, I'm the West End was, and this was when it was still largely white. That's right. White base. So Mo East Point white was the folks. same way. And East Point was the same way. Cabbage Town. And just Cabbage a, Town just to name well. a few places. Yeah. You know? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. Again, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and I'm here with co-producer Ernest Dunkley, and we're, be, we're talking tonight with Chad Russell, who has a long history of incredible experiences, actually. Uh, originally from, as Chad was saying, um, Alabama, and has lived in Atlanta for some time and other parts of the South as well. We, all, we are getting background of his experience, but also we're going to be talking about Jamil el -Amin. So I'm curious, Chad, what is it that here you were having these experiences and what you were learning from your grandmother and so forth about what, whatever you needed to do in Alabama, but when you started getting a little bit older, what is it that, that, that got you involved in or learning about the movement to challenge this oppression? I mean, what, what was it that led you in that direction to a degree. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, basically, it was just the way that, you know, at the people were raising their families. They were raising their children. They loved their families, so they spent 
most of their time teaching them how to survive in this world, being mannerable, being respectful, you know, being thoughtful and mindful of other people, right. and of course to show respect at all times. And unfortunately, you know, we, you know, when you face oppression, it seems as though it's the reason why your parents took time out with you to teach you and to raise you, so you know how to deal with people. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <coughs> so you met Jamil Elamine early. So that, when was that? That was... Well, that was um, in the early part of the... Um, I'm not good at dates, but I'll tell you... In the uh, 1960s my, my, sometime? Well, uh, yeah. Early, early 1960s? It was, it, was, it was probably around that era. Yeah. Yeah, because um, actually it was probably late 60s. I see. Around 69 or right. Yeah, up in there, in that era somewhere. All right, so... When Jamil became Muslim, so you so you began to learn about him being here, right? Did you you make contact with him then, or were, did you have contact with him throughout all these other years as well? Or no, I okay. uh, actually met him when once he came and they, they established a community in the West End. I see. Like I said, when when the, when they started when the Muslims started moving in. I was down on the basketball court. <laughs> right, okay. Of course, that mm -hmm. was my house. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I ran the basketball court. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and All of right. course, you know, Jamil Alameen, being the athlete that he is, he's always taking on a challenge. And yeah, he was quite the football player, wasn't he? Oh, yeah, outstanding athlete all the way around. Yeah, yeah. right. But um, Originally from Louisiana. Yes, right. and, um, but he, he was uh, played at Southern. Right. A little bit at Howard, you know. Very... Very good athlete. Yeah. Very competitive and uh, love challenges. So um, tell us about the West End. I mean, th so what, I mean, I know that when he came, he, he transformed it in so many ways. This is what I hear from so many different people. And you've shared that with me as well. So, and I, and I must, I need to say also that I've talked with a lot of people actually who would just want to go over to the West End and sit down and talk with him. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can remember here in Atlanta hearing about him coming. Mm -hmm. I didn't get over there to see him, unfortunately, but I would see pictures and mm -hmm. I would talk to people who, who had been talking. So, so, you know, I don't know where I'm going with this exactly, except I'd like to hear your impression of like when you met him, when he came to the West End mm -hmm. and what this was like. And yeah. that's kind of a broad question, I know, but. Mm -hmm. Where do you want to go with that, Chad? Well, you know, <laughs> uh, the biggest transition that was made in the West End was that it was it was just a zoo, you know. What do you mean it was a zoo? Like most places that when when people start coming in from everywhere, people everybody like to you know do their own thing and go their own way. So wait a minute, let me step <clears> back here for a moment. So you were saying like when the Muslims started coming into the West End. So you're saying people who came in from all over the place is what you're saying. Is that what you're saying? Well, no, I'm speaking be, along, along with the Muslims. There was already a lot of people there in the West End. I see. You know, because the transition came, like I said, you know, probably during 1969 when the Europeans were still there. Right. And they were exiting. They were right. leaving the city, going out. And as they were going out, people was moving in. Right. You know, and when you're talking about Europeans, you're talking about white Americans. White basically. Americans, okay, basically. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, it was not only in, in, in the West End, it was in mm -hmm. Summer Hill. You had the Jews, then you had the whites, then you had the blacks that lived back up by Prior Road. Also in East Point, you know, from where the Krispy Kreme is on Lee Street and uh, uh, what used to be Garden Street, but it's Ralph David Avenue at there today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, from that point, you know, you used to couldn't even look down that road toward East Point. Because mm -hmm. they had those big old redneck cops behind the Krispy Kreme. Oh, did they really? How of course. <laughs> and of course, they made sure they were the tallest ones that they could find. Uh, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but even in the West End, when he, uh, before Imam Jamil and I started moving in, when the blacks started just coming into the West End, most of the pools and swimming okay. pools in the area, they started filling them up with dirt. As a matter of fact, right across from Imam Jamil's store in the West, in the West End Park, it used to be a beautiful big swimming pool over there. But they filled it up and took it out and put a tennis court there. And then they took and um, 
So, you know, you had a different uh, diversity of people coming in. You had the black Christian nationalists. You had the black Madonna. You had the uh, Catholic Church. You know, had all the uh, Ralph David Abernathy's church. But, and, I, but Okay, I, I don't want to hear about Abernathy's church and the other black churches coming in, but I want to go back to the swimming pool. They were filling it up with dirt because they didn't want blacks to use that pool. Exactly. Or they didn't want blacks and whites to be in the pool together or what? No, it wasn't blacks and white. Most of the whites were leaving and the anyway, blacks. Anyway, yeah, they, they didn't want blacks to have a, a swimming pool. They didn't, have a, they didn't want them to have the pools. Even in the apartments on Donnelly, Donnelly Avenue, they had apartment, big, beautiful pool in the front. Even the uh, apartments on Ogletharp, they had pools. They filled them all up with dirt. And um, so early part of the 70s, you know, when the, when even when the um, when the Muslim came in, one of the things that made people so welcome in the West End was that it was based on community. Yeah. You could hear the Adan being right. called. Right. And the Muslims wanted to come, and they wanted to, you know, get their homes right around the masjid. These are some of the things that made it the West End known around the country. It was not about a lot of other nonsense as people try to put out there, but people were so used to that in most cities, they wasn't calling the Adan on a microphone so that the people in the houses around them could hear it. And when they came and visited Atlanta, they said, oh man, that is something beautiful. I want to be a part of that. That's good. And when, you know, any, there's nothing wrong with when people see something that's good. Everybody want to join something Absolutely. that's good. That's somebody. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I just want to add something here. Um, the listeners know, I mean, I used to work for Mrs. King. I directed the nonviolent program for her in the 1980s for mm -hmm. a while. And it was during this time that I was at the King Center that she was working with the community to plan the King um, Recreational Center, right? Okay. And she would say at meetings, she said, look, when I was raised in Alabama, we never had a chance to learn how to swim. I want to make sure that the kids here in the Auburn Avenue area can learn how to swim. So that's what that's what she did. That's beautiful. She helped create that. It is beautiful. Yeah. I'm sorry, but go ahead. So. Yeah, you, you also reminded me, you know, when I was at uh, Atlanta Junior College, um, I had the experience of working with uh, Helen Krim. That's Dr. Alonzo Krim's ah, wife. Oh, right. Oh, you know, okay. How and, wonderful. Uh, she was head of the... Uh, Health and Education yeah. Department, and Dr. Andy Young, his first wife, yeah. was Jean Young. Jean Young, And yeah. she was head of right. the English Department. Right. I had the pleasure and honor of sitting between both of these men every afternoon oh, wonderful. when they come <laughs> to pick up their wives, and it was a great experience. And All so, right, that's great. Yeah. All right, so let's let's get back to the, um, the West End. Um, so... Uh, it's not the West End. It's where the West ends. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Go ahead, Ernest. Have you, um, <clears throat> over time, you've spent a good a bit of time from the 60s to now involved in, in public and community affairs with uh, Imam. And his influence in the community has been such, as, as you were just saying, that the call to prayer in the area um, was so powerful that people from everywhere moved, uh, Muslims moved into the community because of the, uh, the safety, the, uh, the camaraderie, the feeling of community and brotherhood was there. Has much of that been lost since that started? No, not at all. Uh, the, there were high expectations that when they took the leader away that it would cause the community to crumble. But right. we didn't worship Imam Jamil, we worship Allah. And more so than anything else, the people that came, the thing that really, and we warned them about taking their shoes off because once you get some of this Georgia clay between your toes, <laughs> it's kind of hard to want to walk away from that. <laughs> we got that in Africa too though. <laughs> That's interesting, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, that's why, you know, one of the things that um, made the West End is that, you know, we, it was established as a place of worship. And Imam Jamil's favorite words were, that, hey, you want to beat me? Beat me to Salat. Beat me to Fajr and Isha. That's the hardest, that's the toughest on the hypocrite. To prayer. To prayer. Beat me to prayer. Beat me to prayer. If you right. want to beat me, beat me to prayer. If you want to see me, beat me to Fajr. Mm -hmm. Beat me to Isha. Because, you know, he guarded his prayers just that way. You know, I mean, he was, um, he was a very, very dedicated to his faith. 
into his belief in, in the Creator and Allah. And that's what he, you know, explained to everybody else. He said, if you want to, you know, you want to beat me, beat me to Farja, beat me to Isha. Mm -hmm. You know, those are some of his main words, you know. And, um, and, and that still, that still goes for right now. Please yeah. beat me to prayer. That's right. It remains today. And, and, and it, it exposes, even a lot, it exposes the hypocrites. Surely. You know, the ones that, you know, are not really dedicated to, to the, uh, to the, to the cause, cause of worship. the community. Yeah. Right. But everything in the community is still beautiful. You know, the people are coming and the community is still growing. And, you know, I'm just thankful and grateful that, you know, I had an opportunity and because just being out there on that basketball court when the community first came in, my whole vibe was, what is this thing they call and what is this they keep saying over this microphone? I, I, I'm, you know, this, this thing, I got to find out what this is because, you know, this this thing had it had to be for me because I'm I'm here before they got here. Mm -hmm. But now this thing has gotten me. I'm gonna find out what it is. And I found out he'd sit me down and explain to me the beauty of it. And I and I and he gave me my first Quran, like he folks so often do to so many people. And um, so it was well, but it some was, people don't understand is that when they call to prayer, it's over a, a law over a microphone that that um, projects over a large area. Right. And you hear them speaking in, in, the, in, the, in the words of the Quran, and you don't know what it is if you're a stranger, but it yeah. sounds beautiful. Yeah. Uh, and everyone is acting so correct. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's saying, come to worship, come to prayer. Right. Come to worship, come to prayer, come to success. How can you not want to come want to, to do success? That. Mm -hmm. So is it... Uh, so I'm talking about myself here as well. I mean, I spent a little bit of time in Malaysia. It was a very Muslim country, and I would stay in hotels. And in the morning, at 5 o'clock in the morning, Ernest, I would hear the call to prayer. People coming out on the streets was beautiful, yeah. <laughs> along the lines of what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But, but um, so was it, was it uh, uh, Imam Jamil that, that brought you to Islam? Well... No, it wasn't. It wasn't, okay. It was that call to prayer. It was the right. call to prayer that did that inspiration. Yeah, call, come to success. Why, why is that? Why, it was like, well, I mean... You come know, to prayer, come to success. I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. You know... I'm sorry. Uh, um, America is filled with a lot of sick people. Yeah. And Islam is the medicine. Yeah. Right. It's the cure for I the see. sick. I see. You know, and I was sick. Right. I, I, I thought I was on top of the world, but when you need the medicine, you can only get the medicine from, you know, from the Creator. Okay, I just want our listeners to know that you are listening to WRFG Atlanta 89.3 FM. My name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace. I'm here with co-producer Ernest Dunkley, and I'm pleased to say that we're talking with Chad Russell today about so much, about Jamil el -Amin, but about the country, about the South, about Atlanta, about where the West ends in Atlanta, right? Where it so, is. Or the East. <laughs> <laughs> where the west, where the west or the east ends <laughs> all right so um so now when jamil came to atlanta he it's my understanding that he transformed that community so much into as what you were referring to as a community of the feel of community and i need to say that today actually i was listening to uh, a speech that he gave, I think it was in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, Jamil gave somewhere, I haven't listened to the whole thing, but where he was talking about individual versus community and the importance of community. Mm -hmm. But, and I, and for, for those of you who would like to know, you can go to YouTube and do a search for Jamil el and you'll find all kinds of speeches that he gave. It's just fascinating. Mm -hmm. But how was he, he, he was transformative in so many ways in, in the community, am I right? Yeah, well, uh, it transformed the community in so well, many ways. Basically, the words that Imam Jamil used were not his words. Most of the words that Imam Jamil used are from the Holy Quran. From the Quran, okay. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, um, I, I think that one of the things is that people really respected was the sincerity of Imam Jamil and how he was dedicated to his worship and and you know there's only one reward for good and that's good and he wanted to you know whenever he meet people and greet people he would greet them with their greeting of assalamu alaikum and his very next word are, are you okay do you need anything can I help you can I help you with anything right and that's what I hear all the time about people who have some experience in talking with Jamil, his first, even even 
as he's in jail now is what can I do for you? Yeah. What can right. I, yeah. Can yeah. I help you? Can, can I, help I help you in you? any way? Yeah. You know, and people, yeah. uh, and he was sincere about that. Yeah. And if you needed anything, he, he would respond to that right, right then and there. Right. You know what I mean? The, and when people are con- genuinely concerned about the basic needs of people, your 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 living uh, standards, you know, or uh, do you have food? Do you have shelter? He was just genuinely concerned, you know. I mean, and 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 more so than anything else, I just want to say for the record is that one of the things I loved about Imam Jamil was his sincerity to humanity. And I mean, you know, they want to make him seem as though that he's something that he's not, but that's not true. You know, a person can only be what God created them to be. They can live outside of that. They can be high as an angel, or they can be lower than the scum on the ground. But one of the things that Imam Jamil chose to do was to try to help people as much as he possibly could in humanity because he always expressed, if you're mad, it's okay about being mad, but don't let how you feel show on your face, you see? And one of the things that Imam Jamil was so sincere about humanity is that even right now they have him incarcerated, want to treat him like an animal, but, you know, this is... Uh, Allah, Allah takes care of his own, you know, yeah. anytime he, he promises you that when you when you make the, the Faja prayer, when you make the Isha prayer, that Allah says, I got you. He's your protector, you see. And why would not Jamil want to be the person that he is? Because when 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 people were struggling of oppression, when they yeah, the Klan was at the at the registration booth saying, well, you know, don't you Negro come showing your face here. They, he led people to the voting polls he did. with shotguns Abs- yeah, I know. so that they could go in right. and vote. Yeah. The same man that people sent in the COINTEL Pro yeah. for a man that's trying to do good and doing good to yeah. try to, you know, say that he's doing something that's not right, which is not you know, the standards of Imam Jamil because Imam Jamil want to do things by the book. He do it by the Quran. Yeah. See, the words that he's speaking are not his words. They are Allah words. Well, I'd like to talk also about the, um, the, the number of people who would want to come and visit him. And, and just, just so everyone knows, that included the sheriff and other folks who wanted to sit and talk with Jamil. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, Chad. Well, you know, they had the prison guards and... Uh, where they had him in prison at, in Reedsville, to take Shahada. People, uh, and, and uh, it's just sad the way that the oppressors try to make things so seemingly right and they know that they're wrong. You know, you want to call Jamil Alamin a terrorist and you've already threatened everybody in the world and in the country <laughs> that if they call you a terrorist, that they can go to prison for life. Yeah. And here a man is want to give his life for humanity. Like, he's, you're burning and lynching black people's bodies and hanging and burning them on the street, and there's not one single white man has ever went to prison and did life plus 150 years for hanging and lynching or burning a black man's body. But they can show you today how much they hate you because the the time does not fit the crime. Yeah, You commit a crime today, and they want to show you how much they hate you by giving you life plus 150 years. When they've never did that, and those were some of, they've committed some of the worst crimes that ever been no, committed it's true. in humanity. It's true. You see. But let's talk, let's talk also about, it's my understanding, and you've shared with me as well, like when diplomats were coming to Atlanta, they wanted to come and see Jamil. They came talk, to see talk, Jamil. And yeah. they did, and they wanted their children to meet him. So tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, even though we had the, um, when they're, the, even just an example, there are many opportunities that, um, presidential candidates had sent Imam Jamil invitations to the White House on many different occasions. These people, they know the respect and the level of respect that people around the world have for Imam Jamil. Yeah. That's partly why he's incarcerated right yeah, now. Right. They had diplomats that come from even Iran when the Olympic Games were here. The boxers came to make their salat at the masjid and uh, they were followed by the FBI until they parked right in front of the masjid and started unloading, going in to make prayer, then they, they run off, you see. But you have uh, people, uh, Hakeem Olajuwon, uh, different people that played for, even uh, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you know, people came in. And then a lot of you, just students that was coming to Georgia Tech University, different universities in the city, their families would send their entourage to make sure that 
they were not alone, that Imam Jabir would be able to oversee them and help to make sure that their religion was intact and they was practicing and if they had any problems, he would be there to be there for them. Yeah. And they would send their entourage in to talk with Imam Jamil. And of course, it was all out of good faith because you know, it's nothing like being able to go abroad and go to another country and there's someone that's there that you know that can look out for you. And that was what was happening, you see. Uh, I see that as being a very powerful uh, influence that he's had because prior to him Islam wasn't uh, Islam as practiced by African Americans was looked at as not as as uh, as real as the uh, the Islam in Arabia or maybe Africa but it's people like the Imam that really lifted it up I believe because the respect that the world was showing him has shown that um, the African American has made quite a trip, um, um, has moved from one place to another in such a way that we can't be moved back. That respect is with the community and people like yourself. And I was wondering, over this time, have you really thought about how this may be looking in the future, this, this respect that we have, because that is really something, and how we might manage it in the world, knowing what we know about the past and what's going on in the present. Well, basically, I, I would say there was a strong Islamic movement with Elijah Muhammad. Right. And they were very sincere in their practice and in their deen. And I, 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 I respect highly the work that, that my brother did. And I also respect the work that his son did. Mm -hmm. And more so than anything else, you have to, you, you know, life, life, life meets no strangers. Life is very short. And it, when, a, when, a, when a human being realizes that you've been mistreated for over 300, 400 years by an oppressor. One of the things that it does, it helps to open up everything. It's just like when a caterpillar turns to a butterfly, you see? But Islam has been sent on this planet for medicine for those that have been sick. And if you look at the works that are happening in our country today, Imam Jamil could be a greater help to this society than he can being incarcerated. Because man can only kill and destroy, but it does not determine where your soul is going to go. Only the Creator can do that. Do The that. only thing man can do is kill, but the Creator is the one determine whether you're going to live in paradise or you're going to hell. So all those people out there with the COINTELPRO that wants to be able to come in and infiltrate those that are trying to do good, right. may Allah have mercy on you. Because the people that are leading you and misguiding you cannot save your soul from this wrath of Allah. So we're going to take a quick break and come back to this. I'd like to talk a little bit about what happened with the... Uh, the killing that took place that he was accused of a little bit. But we'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned. Again, my name is Heather Gray, and the program is Just Peace, and I'm here with co-producer Ernest Dunkley, and we're talking with Chad Russell about Jamil el -Amin, actually, who was such a profound influence on so many folks here in Atlanta, in the United States, all over the world. And I need to say, I'm just going to repeat that I've talked to so many people friends of mine who would routinely go over to the Masjid in the west end of Atlanta and want to talk with him and did spend time talking with him. So there's so, yes, go ahead, Ernest. Oh, I was going to say that um, I, I'd be remiss if, if, if I left it, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the work that he put in, I, I see the, the, the work of, of, of Jamal, Jamal as um, being like a flower on his work. People that came from circumstances that were very far remiss from where we would like to be and converted themselves 
and the people around them. Uh, so uh, I see that all as part of a very fantastic growth that has happened since you know, but Elijah Muhammad stepped forth with him. And Elijah Muhammad was from Georgia. That's right. <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> very powerful. Very yeah, very powerful. powerful, yeah. So you're, you're, in, you're thinking here about this, Chad. What, where are you on that? Do you want to respond to any? No, I, I've already said I re really respect <laughs> the work that um, Imam Elijah Muhammad did and uh, mm -hmm. his son, uh, may Allah bless his soul. Yes. Uh, Muhammad, his, his son, and to the family. You know, all due respect, because there was a very sincere, um, great teacher, you know, and uh, you can't help but to respect the work that was done. Anything right. is good, you know, it's only good. Mm -hmm. And uh, may Allah continue to rich the blessed community. Inshallah. S so one of the things that Ernest was asking was about the impact of Jamil el -Amin in Atlanta, but also how, whether or not this had continued, and you said that it has. So he had instilled this sense of community and belonging and so forth, you know, which is really a blessing, mm -hmm. is it not? Yes, it is. You know, so much so, the city of Atlanta, uh, during the time that uh, Imam Jamil was here, um, they respected the community so much, they wanted to have as many functions in the West End as they possibly could. Oh, who's that? Who's they? Who do you mean? Uh, what was the police chief name and the um, the mayor, the one that was it Campbell? It was uh, his name was Bill Campbell. Bill Campbell. Yeah, right. Yeah. Mayor of the city. Yeah. yeah. So he wanted to hold event, events in the West End as yeah, well. Yeah, most of the Other events people. they had, they yeah. enjoyed coming to the West End so frequently that they took the um, the uh, basketball court up from Thomasville and brought it to the West End. Oh, so how <laughs> interesting! Isn't that interesting? So he knew that Jamil <laughs> liked to play basketball. Jamil like that, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> was he was he out there playing basketball All with the folks? Time. Oh, was he First really? Thing I, in didn't, the morning. I didn't know that. Did he? Did yeah. he really? Yeah. At, at the at the at the prayer in oh, the morning, okay. he would, you know, a lot of the brothers would go out under the basketball court and down to the uh, football field and train right. and work out and. Uh, right believe in getting the proper exercise, proper diet, proper worship, proper everything that you needed, you see. And, and that's part of making the community successful because people have something to do within their own community and it makes people feel right at home. Tell us about the store that he had there. What was that? Well, the store was, um, it was a halal meat market and a grocery store. So and what is a halal meat market? The halal is uh, the, the meat that is killed in the name of Allah. Okay. You know, and people, you know, frequently come to get um, just their regular groceries and everything from the from the marketplace, right. and had a chance to speak with their imam if they had personal problems, any type of issues and things that were going oh, on. Okay, that's they good. could. You got your, you know, your spiritual leader here, yeah. and he's always present. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that was such a beautiful thing because, quite frequently, you know, um, when people have problems, they need someone that they can talk to. Right. You know, unlike having to go and try to make an appointment with the mayor. Uh, right. <laughs> so his his ministry. What I mean, he it's it sounds to me like he was just always available for people to to um, right. I mean, at all times, whether he's in the store, whether he's in the the mosque, wherever he yeah. was there for people just to be able to talk about some of their issues. Yeah, that's what makes right? the community. You know, exactly when, when, when exactly. the people that you need to talk to are there, yeah. and yeah. you know, you don't have to look for them. Even he's tell people all the time, if you you're looking for me, you want to beat me, beat me to prayer. Now, one of the th one of the images I always have about the store in the West End was it right next to the mosque? It was, was on the corner. It was on the corner. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, of chair place. chairs right outside the store where yeah. people would sit. Yeah. And talk with him. Yeah. <laughs> right. Had a bench that people would sit. Well, you know, I mean, people That's would right. come. Real community. And, uh, yeah, people would come and <laughs> sit out there on the bench. And uh, matter of fact, come up and you got Hakeem Elijah one and uh, the other big fellow. Uh, from the Lakers sitting out there on the bench talking to Imam <laughs> Jamil. You know. Oh, that's wonderful. And then at other times you got big Mercedes Benz is parked there where the people <laughs> then came from other countries and come in to speak to Imam Jamil. Were you meeting some of those people too? Well, I just frequently I was there on security, you know. I see. You know, just yeah, making sure that everything was everything. You see. Right. Yeah. Okay. But, uh, it's a beautiful. It's nothing. It's nothing better than having the beauty of your own community. You know, where the people that's a, right, that's a, a part of your, uh, your, your, you know, your community, their, 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 their houses are right 
everybody is right in uh, proximity of one another, right? Yeah. You know, and it's such a beautiful thing, you know. Well, frequently, often, Imam Jamil would make it so easy for people to be fed in the community. He would say, hey, Chad, Chad, here, cook this meat. You bring some rice. You bring some bread. You bring some drinks, some water. Don't come without nothing now. You just bring something. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing you know, we got a line that's down in the park by the basketball court that's all the way going back up to the hill by the swings, but everybody got fed. Oh, now that's interesting. So what, mm-hmm. so, so... Was there a lot of that going on? All the you, time. Okay, so you had, what was it like, what was it like a, a buffet? A, how, I don't know what you would call it. What do you call it? What was what, that now? Well, a place where there's food. You just come. You just know, a it's, soup. It, it was just a soup, you know. I mean, it's just like doing the eat this past the uh, Itata. We had three days of uh, of. Of Fasting celebration or celebration after the yeah. eat. Okay. So what we did, okay. we brought okay. in the, the animals and everything to feed the right. people that right. was in need. And the, a lot of people would come in and just buy animals and donate the meat. And we had wow. three grills going. There was people coming off the street eating. Wow. That was Muslim, non-Muslim. Yeah, you that's know, good. Everybody yeah. eat. You everybody see? would have an That's what a community does. People take care of each well, other. Well, how often were you all doing those kinds of things? Well, um, the, every the, day? Not <laughs> quite every day, but, you know, um, most frequently on the weekends and a lot of oh, times, nice. especially when, you know, on the, uh, the eat at the uh, 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 Ramadan is only just one day. Yeah. And we do the same thing. We feed the people and people come out and eat. We do a brunch, you know, right after the Salat and people just spend the rest of the day enjoying each other, making the Salat. And tell us what tell it. us what the Salat is. Well, the Salat is it's five, five Salats a day. You know, you got Faji, uh, uh, Dua, Isha, and um, Maghreb. It's prayers, right? Yeah, five prayers. Five yeah. prayers, yeah. yeah. And um, that's what Imam Jamil used to always highly be up on. You know, if you want to beat me to prayer, beat me to prayer. Come to Faji and Isha. Faji is the first prayer and Isha is the last prayer. Ernest, you wanted to jump in here? Oh, I'm just uh, reflecting. I'm just, uh, reflecting and, and, and really. Uh, you should take the shahada. It's a beautiful <laughs> thing. Maybe I should. Yeah. It's the shahada. You know, you know, one of the things, you know, Allah says that don't die unless you're Muslim. Yeah. And then he said, you better not die unless you're Muslim. I see. Yeah. And I, I think I think a lot for my family because uh, oftentimes I think about the things that my, 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 my family have always taught me. And everybody used to always tell me, say, man. You know, how did you how did you learn these things that you learn? I said, because my family, they prepared me for this world. And most of the things that they taught me was the same thing that is coming out of the Quran. You see. Well now that's interesting. So wait a minute now. So you you were not raised Muslim, you were raised what? What religion? I was raised a Christian. A Christian. But it's all the same. Well, yeah. I just want to hear. I mean, were, oh, were you were you Baptist? Same. Were you what was it? I was a Baptist, I was a Jehovah Witness, I was a saint. <laughs> okay, so you're everything. And then you became... No, no, but, but, really. but the interesting thing is that you're, fa- you're saying your family in Alabama was training you or teaching you about things that really were of the Quran as well. That's true. Like what? Like be honest. Okay. Be just, even against yourself. Yeah. You know, and, and more so than anything, you know, be, be, be dutiful to your parents. And your 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 paradise lies at your mother's feet, I see, and at your yeah. grandmother's feet. Right. You always respect women, um, you know. In in spite of how you feel or think about a woman, God created a woman that she would bear our children and bring her into this world. Yeah, we owe them the respect and the protection for being what God created them to be. Yeah, not trying to be the judge of who we want to be, like so often. We got plenty of judges up in here, but we have to do the things that are good that we're going to get the reward for instead of the things that's not going to bring us any justice or any good. Interesting, yeah. I, I think, I, go ahead. I think what you're saying is so apropos of uh, what Islam is um, and, and also what it is not mm-hmm. in terms of what's going on in the world today. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I do believe that the uh, the position that the the African American Muslim has taken is is because of the the tribulations that we've been through, that our families have been through, what uh, the system has put on us, and the destruction of our families and and our respect. So, 
we really do understand that the woman has to be totally respected. Yes, and sir. that is the point that they strike at when they're trying to destroy you, is to take away. To demoralize the woman. That's they, right. They like, like, you know, this rap music does. Right. And, and, and vendors are the people that paid them so many millions of dollars to come in and demoralize the, the woman. Exactly. You see, uh, people be more mindful of the things that they say and the things that they do. Because everything that you say and everything that you do is coming back to haunt you. Coming back to haunt you. Well, our, right. ti our time has gone so quickly. Uh, I know there's so much more we could talk about this, but I'm wanting to thank you so much, Chad, for sharing all this with us tonight. We're going to get you back, okay? Inshallah. <laughs> all right. Inshallah, I just wanted to say one thing. You Go know, ahead, uh, please. Go ahead. One of the things that I thank my mother for in my childhood growing up what, after we moved from my grandfather's farm over in Alabama, uh, we moved to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my mom used to often tell us and teach us lessons in the things that we were doing. And we early Sunday morning, we would go to every kind of church it was up until <laughs> Sunday night. When we got home Sunday night, it was time to go to bed, go to school. But um, I used to often laugh at this man at this little sanctified church he'd be in there playing his guitar jumping the ground doing his little steps and uh there's a brother in the community named Haroon he said can't you see Chad now when he was a Christian he was around doing the hollering on <laughs> 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 but I just wanted to say I think I think I thank God for my family and I thank him for the experiences that I've had and I thank him for my brother Imam Jamil and for all the great work that he's done and like I said there's no way that Jamal, Imam Jamil would not be anybody any different than he's always been if he couldn't do something for humanity. Yeah. And I mean, at the time in America when all this <clears throat> stuff is going on, he was one that stood out front for humanity before he became Muslim. So I just think, him, I think a lot for him. I think a lot for his life. And I pray a lot, allow him to Get, back, get out of there so we can do a greater work as soon as possible. Sounds wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ernest. Thank you. All right, and I'm going to ask everyone to stay tuned for Revolutionary African Perspectives. Stay tuned.